Hello, this is Kerry Schutz with MathWorks. In this video, I'm going to show how to get the impulse response from time domain measurements, and I'll be using the ratio of FFT method to do that. That's not an official name, that's just the name that I've given this technique. Again, our system is going to be PAM3 in nature, where that means really the signaling scheme or the input signal will be PAM3. In some cases, I'll compare and contrast that with a white noise excitation, uh, but in general, we'll be using PAM3 excitation. Uh, this is our third video on this topic of impulse response extraction. In our first uh, video, we showed a technique based on estimating the transfer function, followed by inverse FFT to get the impulse response, and that's a pretty robust approach. Uh, our second video showed a simplification of the normal equations, where we computed the cross-correlation between the output and the input, and we called that a poor man's estimate of the impulse response. As we saw, that works well when you've got a white noise input, but it doesn't work so well when you've got something that's not white noise, like a PAM3 signal. Then, you know, your impulse response estimate suffers quite a bit. Our method today, I'm calling a simple ratio of FFTs, and it is, in fact, an approximation or simplification on approach number one, where instead of estimating a transfer function, we're just doing a simple ratio of FFTs and then taking the inverse FFT of that. But we'll see that's going to have some side effects they have to be aware of. It's not as robust approach as method number one. Uh, usually I like to introduce the, de the device under test and the excitation, at least in the time domain and um, in the frequency domain before we get into the details of how the technique works. This is also a review from a previous video, so you can kind of fast forward ahead if this is something you've already seen before. Uh, the device under test is a lossy channel uh, with reflections, and you can see its impulse response in the lower left. And I've also got some MATLAB code uh, which uh, generated it. I used the Certes Toolbox channel loss system object with a certain loss and a certain sample time that, that created uh, the impulse response of this channel, impulse zero. That's effectively the output of that system object. Of course, you're free to use any impulse response uh, you wanted to in your simulation. This particular channel had about a 0.25 nanosecond delay and then subsequent reflection space periodically thereafter. I simulated it in MATLAB as in addition to Simulink. This is the uh, MATLAB simulation you see on the right where I simulated it for 150, uh, uh, well, actually a 21 frames, each frame consisted of 150 PAM3 symbols and with an oversampling rate of 16, uh, that came out to be so many samples of simulation. In this case, I've got PAM3 symbols at a particular symbol rate of 5.55 giga symbols per second. That corresponds to about 8.33 gigabits per second because you've got 1.5 uh, bits per symbol with PAM3. I'm oversampling here because really this is a discrete time approximation of a continuous time system. So thus I need some you know reasonably high oversampling rate. And then I use the um, RAND I function to create the PAM3 symbols. I've got three levels, basically zero, one, and two, or one, two, three. And then I center them such that it's a zero mean DC, a zero mean or zero uh, DC signal by centering those around zero volts. So that's where you see the minus one divided by two come into play down here. The ceiling of K divided by 16 just emulates a zero order hold behavior such that I've got 16 samples per symbol. We want to look at this channel in the time and frequency domain. We saw the impulse response lower left, but then you've got the magnitude and the phase response on the right hand side of this slide, where you see it's generally low pass in nature, but it's got these periodic undulations uh, in, the, uh, in the magnitude response. And of course, it's also periodic in the phase response. Excitation, again, always matters when you're characterizing a device under test, and in this case, it's no different. Uh, we're going to be either using our PAM3 signal or our um, random noise signal. The PAM3 signal is a little more challenging always uh, since it doesn't have, you know, just a nice flat white noise spectrum associated with it. If we were to compare um, the white noise excitation in the time domain, and the response in blue. So um, what I'm showing here is basically the input is always yellow, the output is always in blue, uh, and the left side is for white noise. So input uh, white noise in yellow, the response of the channel in blue, same thing down here in the frequency domain. So a nice flat spectrum, uh, white noise, and then the response of the channel 
in blue. Uh, if we were to do the same thing with PAM3, this is what the PAM3 signals uh, would look like, three distinct input levels. And then you would see anything but a flat uh, spectrum for the PAM3 input excitation on the lower right. You see it's got these nulls spaced at approximately the, uh, at exactly actually the symbol rate, uh, 5.55 giga symbols per second. And those can lead to problems. And then you can also look at the signal in the statistical domain or its PDF prob probability distribution function. Uh, with the Gaussian distribution of white noise versus the very just three level distribution of the PAM3 signal. All right, and then we're gonna get into our impulse response recovery methods. I'm gonna fast forward to method three here. We've already covered uh, method one was the transfer function approach where this is how you computed the transfer function, cross spectrum and auto spectrum. This is the, uh, then we converted that frequency response to an impulse response via inverse FFT. And a, a little careful logistics or bookwork. Uh, we had the simplification of the normal equations, method two. And then finally, we're now we're getting today's technique, which is the ratio of FFTs, followed by an inverse FFT to recover the impulse response. Again, our output here, we're just using the common notation of Y. The input is X. We've either got random noise or a PAM3 signal exciting our system. And then, of course, in Simulink, we could look at it in the time or frequency domain, just like in MATLAB, you could do that as well. This approach does require some numerical care, and particularly with the denominator, avoiding the divided by zeros. Um, and again, it's a simplification of the cross spectrum divided by the auto spectrum. And just instead of the full auto spectrum and cross spectrum computation, we're doing a much simpler just FFT of output over FFT of input, where the dot divided by notation just stands for a point wise division, frequency point by frequency point. All right, so looking at the input signal and output signal, just zooming in here, we've got a zero order hold version of the input signals, uh, the filtered version of that through the channel in blue. And if we looked at, again, the input spectrum, if we're not careful, uh, this red uh, spectrum below is the spectrum of the yellow waveform in the time above. If we zoom in on those uh, symbol rate frequencies, we'll see that the symbol just goes, that, that, that data point just goes away in the MATLAB plot. And that's because it's at minus infinity and MATLAB, of course, can't plot minus infinity dB. So that is a problem in simulation that you probably will never see in practice because in practice, you've got noise or you never have perfect synchronization. And so that's a, it's a problem you'll, you know, hit uh, when you're, you know, constructing or synthesizing this data that you'll never see in practice. Uh, these zeros are typically associated with the analysis being perfectly synchronized with your data generation and thus you get these zeros. So there are workarounds for this. One of them is to apply a little noise to the input signal. Uh, you could also kind of, you know, have your sampling a little bit off. I'm not gonna add sampling or time jitter to it, or you could apply a time, you could apply a window to your analysis and that actually does a good job of, of helping with this divide by zero issue as well. So adding the noise eliminates the zeros in the spectrum, just like the windowing does, um, they were, which ultimately allows you to recover your impulse response. You can see what we accomplished with this either change here, and uh, we were able to recover the impulse response. You don't need to add noise and the window, you can do one or the other. All right, so I'm gonna go over now into the tools. I'll escape out of my presentation. We'll go over to our simulate model and take a look here. I've got my input symbols at the symbol rate. I'm oversampling those up to the 16X oversampled rate. I'm applying some noise optionally. Uh, I'm driving a sm very, very small amount of noise, again, to deal, deal with the divide by zero issue. You could make this number actually much smaller if you wanted to. This multipl multiplication scaling factor, driver device under test, look at the symbol, si uh, the signals in time and frequency. And then we've got optionally down here for our, our impulse response recovery in Simulink, we also log our um, signals in Simulink and for post-processing in MATLAB. So instead of logging actually the input to the add noise step, I'm gonna take that off of there. I'm going to um, stop logging that signal. I'm gonna log this signal instead, the true input to the device under test. And we'll say log it, because remember, just this is our device under test here. 
I could also add a little box here just to let you know that this is our device under test. So we just color that in if we wanted to, maybe get everything in there. Okay. All right. So now when we run this model, um, I'm going to do some time domain averaging on the FFTs and the inverse FFT. We can do this all in MATLAB here. And I'm putting this inside an enabled subsystem because I'd like to wait for the system to get into steady state and not process any transients. Uh, so that's what I'm doing there. And then I average those successive impulse response estimates and display them on an array plot over here. All right, so I'm gonna run this model for a number of samples. You can see the impulse response on top, the average impulse response is growing. I could zoom in on that. You could see how it behaves there. Zoom in again. So it does a pretty good job of estimating the impulse runs, at least it, so it appears. But again, I've logged the data to the MATLAB workspace. And so we can see how it does. We logged it as X and Y. So now if we go over to MATLAB, we'll see out, let's see, dot logs out. Let's see, the input is one, the output is two, and the impulse response estimate is three in Simulink. So I'll go to my script, my post product script. The input is one. The output is two and the impulse response estimate is three. And the data from the simulating model was logged at this out data structure where you just pull off by index the particular elements from the model that you want. Okay, so I wanted the input, the output, and the impulse response estimate from Simulink. So I pulled out that data. I'm only interested in the very last impulse response estimate, so that's why you see the word in there. Uh, and there's a squeeze on the X because um, the data is saved in, in three-dimensional form. And I just want, I really just need the two dimensions. I'm going to just do the impulse response estimate over the final 24, or the, at least the second 2,400 samples in the simulation. So I'm ignoring the initial samples, just calling those transients. So I'm taking 2,400 samples of the input, 2,400 samples of the output with window applied take the FFT of those, take the ratio of that, uh, test to see if there is a NAN in the data or any infinities. That's why I look at one of the data points here, quick sanity check, form time uh, vectors, and do the plot of the impulse response. So let's go ahead and run this many lines here. This would be the one pass estimate of the impulse response. And it looks not too bad. I'm gonna zoom in here. You can see there is a difference between the impulse response estimate and the original impulse response in red. The blue is the estimate. Uh, it's not perfect, but again, it, there was no averaging here. This is just over one set of samples. Uh, if I were to do more averaging in MATLAB, uh, then you would see a better estimate. I actually did my averaging over in Simulink using this uh, filter block. You can use the filter block, not just for the device under test, but I also used it for the time averaging. And in this case, I used it as an IR filter, whereas for the device under test, I had it as an FIR filter. So for the IR filter, I just I used exponential averaging. So that's why you see these coefficients here. Uh, and now let's go ahead and uh, look at how, let's take this set of lines. Let's uncomment. Let's run just these four here and let's see how our Simulink estimate compares and let's zoom in and it's a much cleaner estimate because again I have more averages I've got this exponential averaging um, on these estimates and you can see it's a much much tighter estimate we could have done that in MATLAB as well it just happened to be super convenient just to draw down a block as opposed to writing a for loop to do some averaging in a MATLAB environment. If you wanted to see how you do averaging in MATLAB, I did do that in a previous uh, recording on this topic of uh, impulse response recovery. Uh, that was in another script I had run at one point where uh, I, used, I averaged successive cross-correlation results. And this is essentially the averaging line right here where I computed a running average. All right, uh, that's all I really wanted to say on this approach. In the next video, we will get into um, another technique which involves, let me just go back to the slides at the very top. We are going to show one, it's a lot of fun. Uh, we'll, we'll actually 
that show the system identification toolbox in action for doing impulse response recovery. And then we'll get into the LMS algorithm. It's an adaptive approach as opposed to just a block-wise algorithm. Thank you very much. Until then.